Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation's webinar, Pediatric Cardiomyopathy, What Newly Diagnosed Families Need to Know. I'm Gina Petty. I am the Executive Director of the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation. The Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation, or CCF, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to finding causes and cures for pediatric cardiomyopathy through the support of research, education, awareness, and advocacy. Established in 2002, CCF has grown into a global community of families, physicians, and scientists focused on improving diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life for children with cardiomyopathy. September is Children's Cardiomyopathy Awareness Month, and in addition to hosting this important webinar in recognition of the month, we are also organizing various activities and initiatives that seek to educate others about cardiomyopathy in children. These activities include sharing information and patient stories on social media, planning a walk for a cure event, or walking in your own community. We invite you to go the distance with us this month and get involved. Learn more about how you can get involved in this in these efforts at our website, childrenscardiomyopathy.org. During today's webinar, questions are encouraged and welcome. Questions can be submitted via the question box located in your control panel. We will reserve the last 10 or 15 minutes for questions. You are welcome to submit your questions during the presentation as you think of them, and then we will go through them at the conclusion of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the CCF website in the next few days. And we are thrilled today to be joined by Dr. Betsy Bloom. Dr. Bloom is responsible for the clinical, research, educational, and administrative duties of the Heart Failure Service, Cardiomyopathy Program, Ventricular Assist Device Service, Heart Transplant Program, and the Complex Anticoagulation Program within the Heart Center at Boston Children's Hospital. Her research has always been tied closely with her clinical practice, caring for children with cardiomyopathy and advanced heart disease. She came to Boston Children's Hospital after Brown University and Case Western Reserve School of Medicine, Medicine where she completed pediatrics, cardiology, and advanced training in cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and transplant. Following a research career in transplant and BAD, Dr. Bloom has spent recent years exploring the patient's perspective in order to understand and improve communication and prognostic awareness for patients, parents, and providers. Dr. Bloom, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Gina. Let me um, take a second here and share my screen. How's that looking? Looks great, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Gina and Lisa and CCF for all your amazing work that you're doing to support us and our research and our advocacy and our families. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, I um, will start by letting you know, just make sure this is dancing. Oh, there we go. Um, I have no disclosures, uh, financial disclosures. I will disclose that all the photos that you'll see are all children with cardiomyopathy used with permission from their families um, because we're talking about your kids today and I, um, I can't talk about any of my doctoring uh, without talking about patients. So for the next uh, 40 minutes or so, um, the objectives are to talk to newly diagnosed families. So if you are an experienced family, um, we are gonna start from the beginning. Um, we're gonna do cardiology 101. Um, what do I have? What, am I, what does my child have? What do I tell people? Uh, we're gonna walk through the four most common types of cardiomyopathy. And again, if you're, we're talking about a cardiomyopathy that your child doesn't have, please feel free to step away. Um, a short bit on genetics 101 because you can um, you have an upcoming CCF um, forum on genetics. Um, a little bit about living with cardiomyopathy, and then we'll end with the future science, which is really bright. So I can only start by talking about where you are, which is an enormous amount of uncertainty defined by me as a state of having limited knowledge because it is impossible to exactly describe the future outcome. And I think that we need to acknowledge first the uncertainty that you have, that we all have. You want to be told what will happen and we don't know. You can't know the future, um, good or bad. 
Um, and I can't teach you everything you need to know today, um, but you're gonna learn from your child and we learn from our patients all the time. Um, you've already taken a big step by trying to get more resources and joining this CCF. Um, but the biggest challenge is to get used to the uncertainty and to take care of your own mental health as a parent. Um, and once we get there, um, we know that together with your medical team, we're gonna be able to figure out the best future for your child. So let's talk about some of the ways to do that as you align with your care team. You might ask these questions, what are we hoping for? What is, what is the best possible outcome? What are you most worried about? And then what is most likely? And that's the way I like to frame the overall prognosis of children with new diagnosis, um, because we don't know which path they're on. So now that we've conquered our uncertainty and our fear of what's going to happen, um, let's go back to cardiology 101. So I like to think of the heart in sort of three different buckets. And my families that are watching will know that they've heard this a hundred times. There's sort of the heart structure how the valves and the tubes and the vessels are coming out of the heart. There's the heartbeat, the electricity through the heart. And then the whole heart is made up of muscle cells um, that needs to squeeze. So let's just go through these one at a time. So we know the heart structure. You've probably looked at pictures of the heart a bunch of times now, even if you're newly diagnosed. And we know the way the heart, the blood flow goes through the heart. We know that there are top chambers, atria, and bottom chambers, ventricles, and that the heart, the blood comes back from your body to the right side of the heart, goes to the lungs to get oxygen, and comes back to the left side of the heart. The left side of the heart then squeezes the blood out to the body. The function of the heart is to bring food, glucose, and oxygen to all the tissues in your body in order um, for the, your body to work. Most kids with cardiomyopathy have a structurally normal heart. So their valves have the right number of leaflets. There are no holes in their septum. Their blood vessels come out of their heart in the correct way. Um, there are some cardiomyopathies that are associated with septal defects, holes between the top chambers and the bottom chambers. Um, but for the most part, cardiomyopathy is a, is a muscle disease, not a structural disease. Um, you may have uh, you may have met other families in cardiology that have congenital heart disease where the structure of their heart is abnormal. And that is a different group of patients. The heartbeat is the way the electricity moves through the heart. So in most of us, it goes from the top to the middle through the bottom part of your heart. And um, it helps the heart muscle cells communicate with one another to know when to squeeze. We use an electrocardiogram, which I know you all have had seen, um, to measure the heartbeat. So how that electricity is moving from the top through the bottom part of the heart and whether that is happening in a regular pattern or an irregular pattern. If you're having an irregular heartbeat, we sometimes refer to those as arrhythmias. Um, and those are important to know um, because they can cause muscle disease or muscle disease can cause the abnormal rhythm. The other um, types of studies that we use for um, thinking about the electricity in the heart or the heartbeat are, are things like a Holter, which is a electrocardiogram that you wear for 24, 48 hours, 72 hours. Now you can wear them up to a week. Now they're just um, patches that you can take on and off to shower, um, and it will help record your heartbeat um, through sleep and exercise. And then the third type of test that helps us watch the rhythm of your heart is a stress test. So what happens when your child reaches peak exercise? What happens to the electricity in the heart? The other thing that some people look at in an EKG is actually how big your heart is. And an EKG is actually a very poor measurement of how big your heart is. So some people have got their diagnosis of cardiomyopathy because they had a screening EKG and the, the forces were large. It can pick up some types of cardiomyopathy, but it's not a good way to follow how big your child's heart is. Um, so really we keep EKG as a measure of the heart beat or the electricity. And then lastly, we have the heart muscle. 
So the whole heart is made up of cardiomyocytes or heart muscle cells. And those cells need to have all the proteins work together in order to contract and relax. We use an echocardiogram or an ultrasound of the heart, which you I'm sure have all seen, um, in order to measure the heart muscle. It is one way to measure the heart, how the heart muscle is looking. You've heard of an ejection fraction, which is the amount of blood the heart squeezes out with each heartbeat. So we know that if 100% of the blood goes in, about 65 gets squeezed out is an average ejection fraction. So I like this graph, as you see on the x-axis years. So this is one of my patients that I met when they were born and they're now 17. So years on the x-axis. On the y-axis is um, the ejection fraction or the percent of the blood ejected out of the left ventricle with each beat. The dark line through the middle here, you can see is um, the median ejection fraction over childhood. And it's pretty remarkable that the ejection fraction in a normal heart over childhood and adolescence doesn't change and actually through adulthood into your 90s. A normal ejection fraction is somewhere between 54 and 74 with a mean median of about 64%. And it really doesn't change over time, um, which is really interesting. We also know that your body doesn't need a 65% ejection fraction because we have lots of kids whose ejection fractions are 30%, 25%, 20% who are going to school, playing t-ball, playing basketball, doing all their things. Um, and so the heart has a lot of extra ejection built in. In addition, heart muscle function or ejection fraction can change over time. And you can see in this graph, similar X and Y axis. This is a patient of mine who I met in the ICU with the, their first echo um, is the diamond down here with an ejection fraction of about 4%. Um, and then each time we saw him on maximal meds, he got better and now his ejection fraction is four. So we know that there are, we know that the heart muscle function can change over time. We know the ejection fraction should stay pretty stable over your child. The other thing we follow with an echo is the volume of your heart. So for patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, the sicker your heart is, the larger it gets. Um, and that is something that we can also measure by echo. So different from ejection fraction, your heart gets bigger as you grow. Not uncommon, similar to your hands getting bigger as you grow or your feet get bigger as you grow. Um, so the heart gets bigger as you grow. So this is instead of age on the x-axis meters squared or how tall and how much you weigh. Um, but you can see that proportionally to how you grow, this looks a lot like a growth chart, um, your heart gets bigger. And then we can measure by each of these echoes, each of these diamonds, this child's volume or the heart size basically stayed within the normal range for most of their life. Um, you can also see hearts get better. So this was that same patient that you saw the ejection fraction improve. You can see here that their volumes were quite high. So anything under this line would be normal, this top gray line. And you can see when we met him, it was, his volume of his heart was very, very large and it got smaller, smaller, smaller. And now in follow up, his heart size is normal. So we know that, that, that it's supposed to change over time and that also the abnormal growth can return to normal. So now that we've outlined the sort of three normal buckets of a heart, the heart structure, the heart beat, and the heart muscle, we know that those three things can affect one another. So we know that if you have valve disease, say, you are, that stress can cause your heart muscle to be abnormal. If you have abnormal heart beat, that can cause your muscle to be abnormal. And if you have abnormal heart muscle, it can make your heart beat abnormal, and it can also affect the valve function and make the heart structure abnormal. So each can affect the other. 
it can change over time as we've seen, and there's lots of extra function as we don't know. So what is cardiomyopathy? What do I tell my friends and family? Cardio, heart, myo, muscle, puffy, not quite right. Cardiomyopathy just tells us that you have your heart muscle is not quite normal. Um, and that's all it means. There's lots of different diseases of the heart muscle, um, but that's one way to sort of describe what your child has. And there are lots of guidelines, and this is a very old one, but I, it's sort of the, one, the least complicated and the one I like best, which is that cardiomyopathy is a heterogeneous group of diseases of the myocardium. So they just, to confuse us, do myo muscle cardio heart. So instead of calling it cardiomyum, they call it myocardium. So same thing, cardiomyopathy, myocardium, heart muscle. That heart muscle disease can be associated with mechanical, so poor squeeze or electrical abnormal heartbeat um, dysfunction. And there can be lots of causes of cardiomyopathy. The other definition that I think is worth just mentioning here, because a lot of um, Cardiomyopathy programs also are called heart failure programs. Um, and it is an adult term that um, is, helps us think about how the heart is doing its job. So if the heart is providing oxygen and sugar to all your heart muscle cells, if your growth and your activity is normal, if your, um, even if your echoes don't look normal, you don't have heart failure. Um, so heart failure is a term that is very general that has to do with the response of a patient's body to decreased heart function. Um, it does not describe an outcome. It doesn't describe what's going to happen. And it doesn't really describe symptoms that your child may or may not have. We think about the primary cardiomyopathy. So primary in the way that there is something going on with the muscle that makes the muscle um, abnormal. And that those, this group, this is one way to think about it. There's lots of different ways to categorize primary cardiomyopathy. The secondary cardiomyopathy, just to put that aside, is say I have very high blood pressure. And after a few years, my heart pushing against that very high blood pressure, my heart gets thicker and thicker and thicker and looks a lot like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I don't have anything wrong with my heart muscle. It's just, it had to do all this extra work because my blood pressure was so high that it is a now secondary cardiomyopathy. So we're not gonna talk about any of the secondary cardiomyopathies today. It's really not a big group in children and, um, and, and we are talking about primary muscle issues. The four cardiomyopathies that we're gonna to touch on today are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, LV non-compaction, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and dilated cardiomyopathy, the most common um, types of myopathy in kids. We will touch a little bit on the arrhythmic um, cardiomyopathy as well. And then just to say that the acquired diseases, so if your child has an infection of their heart and has a myocarditis, infection of the heart muscle cells, that can, infection can get cured, can go away, and you can be left with a primary cardiomyopathy in the same way that there's a peripartum cardiomyopathy, if a post-pregnancy um, primary cardiomyopathy, um, and then some myopathies induced by arrhythmia. So we know a lot about um, cardiomyocytes or heart muscle cells. And over the last 10 years, the details of what we know and, uh, and how they work is just incredible and nothing that I could have even imagined when I started. Um, we are not gonna walk through all of that, only to say that it is, um, we are learning more every single day. And the idea that we will be able to fix or cure cardiomyopathy as opposed to just treat it um, is just on finally on the horizon. Um, and, um, and I will tell you about some really exciting work that's happening. Um, it is really important to think when you see a cardiomyopathy patient to make sure you're ruling out 
all those other secondary things. So is there high blood pressure? Does the patient have thyroid issues? Are there some reversible things that you could do to make this heart better, whether they have muscle disease or not? So we're gonna start with uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and my echoes aren't working today, so we're gonna pretend. Um, but we know that dilated cardiomyopathy is the most common um, cause of cardiomyopathy in children. Its frequency is still very rare. One in 100,000 children are diagnosed each year. Um, most common in infants and in the first year of life. And you can have a variable, variable presentation. Some of your children might have presented acutely sick in the intensive care unit. Some might be picked up in a murmur or in a prenatal ultrasound, or maybe your child has some GI symptoms or some growth delay. Um, lots of different um, ways to pick up dilated cardiomyopathy. The way it looks is that the heart is big, dilated, um, the muscle gets thinner, and the ejection fraction goes down as patients get sicker. And the opposite happens if you have a good response to medications, you can present quite sick and you can reverse that remodeling and actually shrink down your heart, get back to normal muscle. We know there are lots of causes of dilated cardiomyopathy. And again, a lot abnormal. Um, it, it, um, it doesn't matter once you have a diagnosis of cardiomyopathy where it came from. Um, so we know that many of the patients with dilated cardiomyopathy present quite sick in our hospitals, in our ERs, um, in clinic with, with respiratory distress. Um, and the outcomes of dilated cardiomyopathy are really hard to sort out. Um, and I will tell you, I just picked this one because it's the most recent uh, Melanie ever presented um, this in 2014. And it shows that of all the patients di presented with dilated cardiomyopathy, half of them worsened and needed transplant. 20% of them came back to normal and 30% were fine and outpatient on medication, but still had evidence of dysfunction. Um, it is really hard to take a group of patients with dilated cardiomyopathy and put them together and follow them over time. The medications, the treatments are changing so quickly that outcomes now are so different than they were 10 years ago. And if you think about this study published in 2014, this is the you know, two-year outcome. So these are some patients that are 2004, 2007, 2015. 14, 13, they weren't exposed to the kind of medications we're using now. Um, there's a study very similar to this that showed completely different numbers. So it really is hard um, to study it. Um, the, P the PCMR, which is a cardiomyopathy registry, which has been really well supported by CCF and the NIH, um, had, did a really good job for many years collecting all the data on all the children with cardiomyopathy. And there's incredible data if you want to read more about the data. For me, the data doesn't help my individual parent because there's 400 kids and half are transplanted. I don't know if that child is in the half that's going to be transplanted or the half that's not going to be transplanted. So it doesn't really help thinking about an individual child to look at all these all this data. I know that many of you are very excited about the data and love to look at the data, um, but it doesn't really help us when we're in the door, in the room with you with the door closed. Most patients, dilated cardiomyopathy is the type of cardiomyopathy that responds the best to medications. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is the rarest um, and is the hardest to diagnose. It is a disease of the muscles that make the muscle hard to relax. So the ejection fraction is commonly normal. The muscle measures normal, the volumes measure normal. So often even your echo is read as normal. Most kids with restrictive cardiomyopathy have been seen multiple times by the pediatrician, by the ER, with a diagnosis of asthma, um, very common. Um, and by the time they get to cardiology, they often are sick. Um, it's real, very rare, 0.04 per 100,000, and only 4% of all of you, of all your um, cardiomyopathy. The outcomes are worse, and the thought 
Um, and that, but that also is changing. So we know that back in when I started doing this in the mid '90s, there was a thought that there was a very high risk of sudden death in pa in children with restrictive cardiomyopathy, and so those patients got listed right away. Um, that hasn't actually turned into truth over time following these kids. Um, and so now a diagnosis of restrictive cardiomyopathy, especially with some of the newer agents, um, these kids have, um, have been able to have long, um, long lives through, um, through childhood um, without transplant. We know that for this group of patients, MRI is a very useful tool. Um, but these kids are at risk for irreversible pulmonary hypertension. That's high blood pressure in the lung vessels. This is important because if you have irreversible pulmonary hypertension, you cannot even be considered for a heart transplant. And so if that's something that's in your goals of care for your child, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so for kids with restrictive cardiomyopathy, going to the cath lab every year or two or every six months if there's concern um, is very common. Um, we talked about how the risk of sudden cardiac death seems to be changing, maybe because we're looking for signs and symptoms to transplant sooner. Um, and we talked about that. There, this new data on the SGLT2 inhibitors, which is um, a new medication that's really been shown in the adult world to have um, pretty dramatic effects on um, preserved ejection fraction heart failure. Um, we've been using this in, in some of our um, younger kids with restrictive physiology, and it does seem um, to be uh, maybe moving the needle. We're, we're very hopeful. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, is the third type um, and very different from um, from dilated and restrictive cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is when the heart muscle gets very, very, very thick. Um, they don't have trouble squeezing at all. Some of them have trouble relaxing, um, but the biggest risk in this group, um, it, so it, this group presents often with family history. Um, so if you have a parent or a grandparent with HCM, you often will get screened and we pick up a lot of kids that way. Um, these kids will also present with chest pain or fainting. Um, and this is the kind of heart disease that the media um, talks about a lot because we have um, adolescent athletes who have a, a, a event on the field and get resuscitated, um, or some of our um, you know, Celtics, Reggie Lewis, very famous um, uh, basketball player here in Boston. Um, and so the media coverage around sudden events in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is quite extensive. Um, initial evaluation for these patients are echo, MRI, EKG, Holter stress test, and genetics, all the things that we mentioned already. Um, the couple things that determine whether you need treatment for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or not, first there's your thickness or your hypertrophy can happen around the whole heart, which we call symmetric. Those kids are more likely to have a syndrome called Noonan's or have a, some other issues besides just hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and then there are kids who have asymmetric hypertrophy. It happens mostly in the septum. And when you have septal hypertrophy that gets in the way of the outflow of the heart, that left ventricular outflow tract obstruction can cause quite... Um, quite an issue. So we watch for the obstruction. We use medications like beta blocker, verapamil, calcium channel blockers to try to decrease the amount of squeeze so that that obstruction doesn't get worse. Um, but in some children with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they need to go to the operating room to actually have some of that muscle removed. Um, there is a new medication. Um, that is uh, being used in adults called Mavicantum. It is a myosin inhibitor. So it inhibits the muscle squeeze. So opposite dilated cardiomyopathy where you want them to squeeze better. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we wondered if you squeeze less hard, would your muscle get smaller, get less thick? Sort of like if you are doing bicep curls with a lot of weight, your muscle gets 
bigger. If you go down to less weight, maybe you bulk less. So um, there has recently been published the phase three placebo control trial in adults with hypertrichardia myopathy. And this drug actually decreased the alpha tract obstruction and the patients on drug went to the operating room significantly less. So this is a really, really exciting advancement for patients with, with hypertrichardia myopathy who have obstruction. We know, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the risk of um, sudden events in kids with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There's a couple of webinars in the CCF library all on this. Um, I know there's an upcoming webinar on ICD placement and it is not my expertise, but I will just say that we refer to an ICD or intercardiac defibrillator is a small device that gets put attached to your child's heart or your heart. And if you have abnormal rhythm, arrhythmia, that becomes dangerous or life-threatening, the your ICD within your body will shock you out of that arrhythmia rather than waiting for someone on the field to go to the high school, get the defibrillator paddles or waiting for the ambulance to come to do, um, to do that shock. And so there are criteria for whether patients with HCM need a defibrillator. And again, there are multiple adult and now pediatric calculators where you put in all the information about your child, how thick, whether the MRI is positive, whether they have symptoms, um, and it can give you the relative risk of whether you might need an ICD or not. Um, there's the marker for the ICD webinar. It was in May, 2023. It's, it's quite good and goes into detail. The new sub-Q ICDs, so instead of actually having surgery to put in this defibrillator, um, there are now little um, defibrillators that can just go under your skin and do the same thing. They've been shown to be equally effective, not early on, but mo most recent studies. And um, again, this is gonna change the field for our kids if, you don't have to have a big procedure and, um, and it can be changed out easily. Um, it, again, thinking about what the future science is doing to help us take care of, of uh, all of, you, of the newly diagnosed families. Um, patients with uh, HCM, many families have an AED at home um, for that risk. Um, and again, something to talk to your doctor about. And then sports participation is um, a very hot topic. Um, as um, with all my families, with all types of cardiomyopathy, I feel like it is shared decision-making. I feel like the evidence is, um, the data is not 100% clear and it is, um, and you are balancing risk, risk of a sudden event with the benefits of playing on a team. Um, and that patients and parents and providers need, and schools and coaches need to come together to make a decision that's right for your child. Um, that may be obvious um, and it may um, not be obvious, um, but I think there'll be a lot more um, information around, um, around sports participation in all of our patients. But we know that moderate exercise is good for all of us. Um, just a few words on LV non-compaction because it's gotten a lot of um, press in the last uh, five years or so. This is a type of cardiomyopathy where the heart muscle is not compacted or tight um, and has all these sort of little finger-like projections into the space where the blood is. Um, non-compaction just as a diagnosis by echo is not really a disease. You can have non-compaction of your myocardium with normal function and a normal heart and live a normal life. Um, but we know that patients with non-compaction may be at higher risk for becoming dilated or hypertrophic or restrictive or some sort of mixed phenotype. So we follow these kids closely and we treat them on the path that they're on by their physiology, not just based on the fact that they are not the only thing about non-compaction is you can imagine in these little um, crypts um, that blood could get in there and clot 
um, and then open up and cause stroke. And so we do wonder in patients with non-combatant whether their thrombus and stroke risk is higher. That has not been panned out in any of our studies. And then just one slide on the arrhythmogenic ventricular cardiomyopathy, because there's a lot of work being done on, um, on this disease. We now know what the actual genes are that cause this specific disease in families. Um, and there's a lot of work on actually taking and putting them back in. So what about evaluation and management? Um, we are, um, we're not gonna talk about um, specific medications today. Um, again, there we could spend a whole hour just on the medical management of dilated cardiomyopathy. Well, we know that there are medicines that can slow the progression of disease. We know there's rhythm pacemaker and ICD interventions that can prolong life. There are cath based interventions that may be relevant to your child. And there are surgeries, including ventricular assist devices and transplant that can help um, be the next um, the next surgery for your child. There are lots of guidelines around the management of pediatric cardiomyopathy or heart failure, and, um, and each group has a little bit of a different twist, but we are a very tight community. We are a very small group, at least in the U.S. and Canada, and we work pretty closely together. We see a lot of each other's patients in second opinions. We, um, we up titrate medications very similarly and we're often talking to one another more than once a week. So um, it is likely that your, um, that your doctor knows all the other doctors taking care of all these other patients. Um, we're not gonna go through the details of heart um, medical therapy, but again, in the questions, I'm happy to talk about some of the newer therapies. I wanna to touch just briefly on the genes because um, I think this, um, there's so much hope around having a genetic diagnosis and there's so much anxiety also around having a genetic diagnosis. And I can't get my brother in to do his echo and I can't get my mom to do her genetic testing. And, um, and so I just wanna give you like the genetics 101 of how I think about um, genetics and cardiomyopathy. Um, it's not exactly, I think, what all my, how my, all my colleagues think of it. So a gene is the instruction manual for our body. They are the directions for building all the proteins and the proteins are what help muscle cells work. There's over 25,000 genes and the genes are made up of DNA, that's the blueprint. Every time a, a cell replicates, that DNA has to replicate. And a mutation is a natural process in every DNA sequence. We all have mutations in our, in our sequence. So if you have a sperm and an egg that get together, create a cell, that cell divides into two and then into four and then into eight and then into 16. Every time a, that cell divides to get to a baby, that DNA has to separate and recreate and replicate. There are often typos in that replication. And those typos happen all the time, 100,000 typos each time the cell divides. It's sort of miraculous that there aren't more mutations that matter. Uh, so we know that if the gene change happens as a typo, when it replicates while the baby is growing, that is a genetic cause of cardiomyopathy. That typo, if it happens in the part of the DNA and part of the gene that codes for the protein in the heart that causes muscle contraction, that typo matters. There are tons of typos that don't matter that are in parts of the genes that do not. If that typo then in, say I have a typo that caused me to have cardiomyopathy, and then I pass that typo on to my child, that is an inherited. So just a subtle difference, but um, important thing. Um, so some typos matter, some don't. And that's why if you've had your gene testing and you get a var variant of unknown significance, it's just because we don't know whether that typo is what caused your heart, to, your heart muscle disorder or not. 
um, if there's a common typo in the whole family and they all have cardiomyopathy, then we say, oh, look, we're so smart. There's our genetic. Um, it's important because that's for the sciences, but we also know that you can have heart, a cardiomyopathy as a grandfather and need a heart transplant when you're 20 and your grandchild could have cardiomyopathy that stays stable for their whole life and never gets worse. Um, so the penetrance or the way that it presents year to year, um, generation to generation is not clear. Um, and then this is just to remind me, so I transplanted Tina when she was a teenager um, and she called when Luke was four and said, um, you told me that I couldn't pass this on. Um, we just aren't smart enough to know all the things. And I think when we don't know, we just don't know. And we are learning so much every single day. So just to change direction a little bit and end on um, this idea of how our kids learn and understand their cardiomyopathy over time, all of our kids are different. All of my kids are different from one another and they're all gonna interpret their disease differently. Um, this is to remind me that we talk to families whose kids have cardiomyopathy in the first year of life. We treat them with medications um, and then off they go. And then when they are six, we think of all the things they need to think about. They think about why is my heart going fast? Why am I in first grade and I need to take medicines and my friends don't? Why do I have a G-tube and my friends don't? Why can my friends play? sports and my family has said that I can't. Um, all of those questions at a six-year-old level. And this is Erin, obviously when she was born and when she was just about to get onto the um, first grade bus. Um, and then our kids keep growing up. And when they're 11, they have different questions about cardiomyopathy and we have to be ready for them. We have to be ready for those answers. And then they're in high school and they say, well, I'm going out to a party and I just have Erin called me one day at midnight and said, I just had two beers at a party, what should I do? Um, we need to help them become well-adjusted high school students. What are their skills? How are they gonna navigate taking their medications when they go to Washington DC on their school trip? Um, and so each, at each development milestone, they also are interpreting their cardiomyopathy in a different way and we have to be ready. Um, and then they grow up and this is Erin's wedding last summer and um, meeting with her and her fiance, now husband, and talking about what to expect. At, this is actually at post-transplant, but um, with um, cardiomyopathy or transplant, sort of the same thing, um, what to expect for her family, her family planning, um, and really watching. Um, this is like the highlight of this job is watching this and being able to help kids understand their heart issues over their lifespan. So what about our teenagers? I'm gonna whiz through this because I just wanna show you this really um, interesting data. So um, with me, Melissa Cusino in Michigan, we um, asked 50 to 51 young adults, adolescents and young adults about their preferences about making decisions for themselves. This was a group of patients who were either had cardiomyopathy, a transplant or who were um, having a procedure for their heart. Um, and we asked their parents also. And um, interestingly, parents thought that only 12% of parents thought their child should make these complex decisions. And most parents felt that um, they should make the decision, but strongly consider the doctor and the child's opinions. And when we asked, um, and very few parents thought the doctor should make the decision. When we asked the patients, the adolescents and young adults, they thought should um, make these decisions, um, the patients thought the doctor or the patient should make the decision, and the patient should make the decision together in 13%, that the doctor should make the decision in 20%, and 0% of our adolescents and young adults thought that their parents should make the decision. So somehow we have to transition um, to allow our adolescents to, um, to think about this. Um, so what do we say to our kids? I think we have to acknowledge their loss and grief and allow for anger and unfairness. And for us who have a child who might've been diagnosed at age one, to hear that anger and unfairness come out when they're 12 feels so unusual to us as parents or doctors, but to them, they're just starting to understand the information. 
Um, remember they're watching you and help them find other, at, other um, outlets. Get help early if it seems like they're struggling. And then the one piece on this slide I just wanna point out is one of the things I tell my teenagers often is, um, if I were you at this visit, I would have these questions and I list all the questions. And then I say, let me know which one you want to answer to them. And sometimes they're like, I don't wanna know the answers, any of those answers. Sometimes they're like, I have all those same questions. We need to have this conversation. So I think that that is a very helpful piece. Um, one shout out for the unaffected siblings because um, having watched them over many years, um, they feel this pull to be happy. They're lucky, they don't have it. They, have, they feel jealous because the parents spend more time with the patient with myopathy, but then they feel guilty for being jealous. Um, they often talk about how their problems, they can't bring their problems home because they're too small compared to um, what their parents are dealing with. Um, so um, I think this is a really, really interesting piece um, that you are all dealing with way, way more acutely than I. Um, and then just to move into the really exciting part in the last two minutes, um, our simple view of heart disease looks like this. Abnormal heart structure, genetic abnormalities lead to this abnormal gene activity to progressive heart disease. And our medications, have only been able to deal with the progressive heart disease. Um, what if we could back it up and be, part, be back here? Our technologies to deliver genetic therapies to patients' hearts are developing rapidly. Some approaches are already being used to treat patients with muscle disease. And you, I'm sure many of you have seen some of the Duchenne's data. Um, Quickly, some examples of some of the genetic therapies that we're working at on here at Boston Children's. Um, Barth syndrome is a type of dilated cardiomyopathy that only affects boys. Um, we have, I, or Dr. Pooh's lab has identified the gene that causes Barth's cardiomyopathy, and they have attached that gene therapy to a viral vector, injected it back into the mouse models of Barth's, and those hearts have gotten better. Um, they are in the final stages of picking the candidate to which part of the gene to put back in. Um, and I suspect that this will be a trial, um, not in the not too distant future. Um, they've also figured out the gene therapy for a type of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy in the similar way. Um, they are very close to preclinical, they're in preclinical testing, very close to clinical testing um, using the candidate gene to actually reverse this type of cardiomyopathy. And lastly, we thought we couldn't make heart muscle cells when I was training. It turns out that you can take stem cells, you can make a heart muscle cell. And in fact, um, in um, Kit's lab, he has been able to take those muscle cells, grow them in the shape of a ventricle. Um, so imagine if your child at some point needed a heart transplant instead of waiting for a donor, you could take your blood, you could grow your own, and you could put your own new heart muscle back in. So I'll leave you today. That was a lot. Cardiomyopathy is a chronic condition with multiple implications. Most patients continue to have long, strong, and productive lives. Let's ask providers to tell us what we need to know, even the hard stuff, especially when your child is well. That's when you can most perceive it. Let's be at peace with the uncertainty because it's inevitable. Let's be sure you all, parents, take care of yourselves. Um, and let's not be afraid to talk to our kids. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Bloom. That was fantastic and so informative. Um, We'd like to um, open up the, the Q&A session. We do already have a fair amount of questions and we are going to do our best to get through all of them. I just wanted to reassure everyone that if you asked a question, um, even if it is not answered in live time today, if we run out of time, we will get you an answer. Um, if that um, you know needs to be taken offline, we will definitely respond and coordinate Dr. Bloom's response to you. So just please rest assured for that. Um, but just a reminder, um, you can, 
submit your questions on the Q&A panel. Um, please, you know, generally um, we keep the Q&A to questions of a general nature and not to provide any sort of specific medical advice for um, your or your child's condition or case, specific case. Okay, so with that, we can get started. Um, one of the questions that comes up a lot is, for families, um, and to your point when you spoke about how it's a close-knit community of providers, um, what guidance or suggestions would you give families who may not live or, you know, be nearby a center that specializes in cardiomyopathy? Yeah, what a great question. So um, there are um, cardiologists like myself who um, only take care of patients with cardiomyopathy. And then um, there's a huge group of families like yours whose primary cardiologist, pediatric cardiologist, takes care of all kinds of patients. Um, there are, um, those pediatric cardiologists are incredible. They call us all the time. Um, we are most cardiomyopathy programs are happy to do a second opinion for a primary pediatric cardiologist. Um, so if you are somewhere where you're not in a cardiomy cardiomyopathy specialty clinic, um, your cardiologist can reach out to any of the centers um, for a review. Um, and I think that we, you know, certainly here in New England, we try really hard to get up to um, our clinics in Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire, um, every once in a while, we're in very close communication with our um, primary cardiologists in our region. Um, so I think that um, having a second opinion or thinking about how to maximize medications, if things are going really well, truthfully, I'm not sure I would bother bringing another provider in. I think if things stall or if function isn't recovering or you're starting to talk about things like transplant or surgery, then I think it makes sense for those families and those patients to have a second opinion in a cardiomyopathy center. Great, thank you. And just as a an, as an aside, I wanted to mention that CCF does have uh, the Centers of Care directory. So I'm going to put our link in there if you in the chat. If you are not yet a member, you're welcome to join, and then you can access all of those those uh, contacts for the centers in our in our program. Um, okay, next question is um, you're getting a lot of of thanks as well for a great presentation. Um, uh, my child's cardiologist told told us that the term LVNC is no longer used. Now it is uh, moving toward hypertrabeculation. Would you uh, be able to speak to this and help us understand more detail about where patients with LVNC now fit in? Um, this particular person's uh, child also has a dilated left ventricle, but not diagnosed with DCM. So uh, how does that connect? Yeah, I think um, hypertrabeculated LV or LV non-compaction is just a description of how the muscle looks on MRI or on echo. It doesn't really give us any information about how the child's going to do. Um, so far, it seems like if you are more not, if you have hypertrabeculation and you're a little dilated, then we treat you like the dilated group, maximize your medications and we watch your function. Um, if you have non-compaction and you more look um, like difficulty relaxing with a normal ejection fraction, then we go into the restrictive. So for our practice, we don't really put them in their own box. They sort of end up in another box. Um, and the non-compaction is just what brings them to care um, because of that abnormal look. I'm sure we'll learn more about it. Um, but if, you know, we also see autopsy series of 70 and 80 and 90 year olds where there are hearts with non-compaction and nobody ever knew and they had a normal life. So um, I think we're still learning a lot about that. Thank you. Um, are there different um, screening guidelines when there's a positive family history, depending on what type of cardiomyopathy it is in a family? Yeah, that's a really good question. There always was um, because we didn't know the genetics of some types of cardiomyopathy. Now that there is enough genetic information, I think any child who has cardiomyopathy, um, their siblings and their parents should be screened. Um, 
we, it, we used to think that restrictive cardiomyopathy was not familial and couldn't be passed on. We um, always screened hypertrophic cardiomyopathy family. I think at this point with what we are learning, um, it, it's such an easy screen. I mean, especially if the sibs are over three, you know, an echo to just take it off your brain and know that your other kids don't have it, to know that you do or do not have it. I think, um, although nobody wants to screen and especially the dads, for some reason, they hate to go screen, but um, it just, if it's even in your mind at all, it's such a relaxation to know that your child, your sibling child is normal, has a normal heart that, I I don't I have a very low threshold. Thank you. Do SGL2 inhibitors play a role in increasing EF or do they just prevent worsening? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm not sure we know. Um it it I mean we have used them now in a good number of patients, and it does feel like um, in patients whose ejector fracture is sort of stuck, um, that maybe it gives it a little bit more of a boost. Um, and certainly in the restrictive physiology patients, um, it, it seems like there's some direct effect on the heart that I cannot quite explain biochemically. Um, I, it is a great question. I hope to have the answer for that sometime soon. Thank you. Um, can you speak to the interplay, uh, including prognosis, trajectory, uh, epigenetic impact between pre-existing cardiomyopathy and myocarditis, um, particularly if it's myocarditis with post, uh, I'm sorry, post-COVID? Yeah. Um, also a great question and a really big area of, um, of research and of interest. Um, we wonder whether, so myocarditis is, um, is a infection of the heart triggered by an, an infection. Sometimes that infection is no longer there, but the body's immune response to the infection creates a heart muscle disease. Um, we do wonder always that um, the patients that get myocarditis, were they gonna get cardiomyopathy anyway? Um, I think it's such an interesting question, the response to some kids to the COVID vaccine and to COVID myocarditis. It does not seem like that was a higher incidence in our cardiomyopathy population. And we did look really hard through COVID. Um, it, did, it does not seem that there's a, increased risk of myocarditis from COVID or from the vaccine in our cardiomyopathy patients than in the general population. Um, so I'm not totally sure that was the question, but that uh, that's what we know. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, so we do have a couple of extra questions that we were not able to answer right now in the hour, but um, if my colleagues could please just save um, save the chat to make sure that we're capturing all of that, and then we will definitely connect with Dr. Bloom and get you her feedback uh, to any question that was still pending. Um, in our final last couple of minutes together, I just wanted to thank Dr. Bloom again um, and also give a reminder for a couple of upcoming events and um, and, and uh, activities. So one of the things I just wanted to, to note um, for anyone that's on this webinar today as a newly diagnosed family, we're having a uh, what we call heart to heart coffee chats. Uh, they are virtual chats that we do here on Zoom. Um, our next one is scheduled for next week uh, on September 20th. And it's really a follow up to, to this webinar, um, though, you know, it's not mandatory that you have attended today. Um, but it's really just a, a time for newly diagnosed families or recently diagnosed families to connect with each other, with uh, CCF staff, and learn more about our resources, our services. And we're also going to have several of our parent ambassadors um, at that chat as well to just, uh, you know, connect and and share stories and be there, uh, you know, for support uh, and resources for each other. So we invite you all to join us for that. Um, and we'll send out the link to that as well. 
Um, this webinar is, you know, going to be available on our website. Uh, we will have registration opening soon for our next uh, couple webinars this fall. In October, we're doing um, a webinar on sudden cardiac arrest education and, and awareness for cardiomyopathy families. Um, and then we're also going to do a webinar in November focused on genetics and uh, gene therapy um, uh, developments. So stay tuned for more information and registration on that. And again, it's awareness month uh, this this September. So we invite you to join us in those efforts. Um, and this has been a great, a great presentation. So Dr. Bloom, thank you again for your time and expertise with us. It's much appreciated. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.